Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. We are glad to see the house of the Lord this evening. We're ready to worship the Lord tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. As we open the service this evening, as we go to the Lord in prayer, let's remember several this evening. Let's remember Janie's dad in prayer. Uh, that God will continue to touch him. We saw some videos today of him walking in rehab. So we're very grateful for that. Amen. And um, let's continue to remember my brother-in-law's um, dad, um, Jerry Spencer, in prayer as he's still in the hospital. Uh, let's continue to pray that God will touch him. And let's remember Donnie Duncan in prayer today. And continue to remember Brother Paul Brooks in prayer that God will continue to give him a good recovery. And also let's remember um, Mary Snow in prayer. She's recovering from eye surgery. Let's continue to pray for Mike Ingold. Remember Mike Ingold's roommate. Um, he fell and um, was got taken to the hospital. So remember him in prayer. Continue to remember Gail Edwards in prayer and Linda Wilson. And all of our shut-ins in prayer that God would just touch them in a mighty way. Yes, yes, sir. Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God's blessing upon this service tonight. And that God would just anoint us tonight where we're at. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you for this evening. Yes, we ask God that you would just minister and move by your power. We pray, God, that every need would be met tonight in the name of Jesus. We pray you would have your way in this house, Father. God, we pray you give us strength, Lord. We know you're able. And God, we're depending on you to move tonight, Lord, on behalf of all these requests, Father. We pray, God, for everyone that's listening tonight via internet or by phone, God. I pray you would touch them tonight in the name of Jesus. Lord, anoint our time tonight. For that God will give you praise and glory for everything. For it's in Jesus' name we lift you up, God. Amen. Let's worship the Lord this evening. And Sister Janie gets ready to come to lead us in a song. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. How is everybody? We trust everyone's doing well. I say everybody and it's just our family. But anyway. Anyway. Uh, out there in uh, Facebook land or wherever you might be listening to this on the CD that will come in the mail or wherever. We just thank you for tuning in and being there and listening tonight. All right, if you will, help us sing Where the Soul of Man. I always say Where the Soul of Man is Where the Soul Never Dies.
don't mind, I want to sing this little chorus. Uh, we sing it with the residents when we go to the nursing home. Uh, and of course, everyone knows it. Can you help me sing? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Let's do one more time for the Holy Ghost. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. And Brother Cobble, uh, one more thing too. Um, I want to have a special prayer. Uh, Jenna told me of a young man that was in a car accident down in Florida uh, just a few days ago. And I called that young man last night, spoke to him on the phone. His name is Gavin. I want to have a special prayer right now for Gavin. I don't know who he is, but God does. Amen. He told me he was a believer in Christ. I don't know his spiritual condition, but there again, God does. So would you help me pray for Gavin? As far as we know, he's, he's still in the hospital. He has 23 stitches in his head and broke 12 ribs. Uh, so let's, let's lift up Gavin in prayer tonight. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come to you, God, thanking you, Father, for another day, God. Father, and I pray, God, that you would just be with us, God. Uh, Lord, tonight, God, thank you, Father God, for bringing us together tonight, God. And, Lord, we pray, God, that you would just to touch and anoint God, Brother Copel. God, as he stands, Lord, to preach your word tonight, God. Lord, touch and anoint him, Father God. Speak through him, God. Lord, the words that we need to hear tonight, Father God. And, Lord, we lift up, God, we lift up Gavin to you, God, there in Florida, uh, Lord, he was in a car accident, God, and we pray, God, that you would go right there, Lord, in that hospital room, God, right now at 10 minutes after 7 a Wednesday night, and God, that you would touch him. Lord, I speak peace over his mind, God, and I pray, God, for his family as well, God, that you would lift them up, Lord, during this time, God, give them all strength, God, Lord, and we pray, God, that you would just heal Gavin, uh, Gavin's body, Father God, and Lord, renew, God, the truck that was damaged God we pray that you would just uh, replace that God and uh, Lord we just thank you God that he was alive and he is alive and God just as he told me last night on the phone I'm thankful to be alive and I said yes you are you are blessed to be alive and God I pray that this would always be a reminder to him God to be thankful to you and Lord we'll thank you and praise you God for all things God in Jesus name amen thank you Lord Help me out, Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yes, Lord. Amen. So glad that we can gather together to worship the Lord this evening. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. God is so good. Yes, He is. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, tonight I want to talk about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. You see, last week we talked about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Okay. We talked about how the creative power of the Holy Spirit, the revealing of the Holy Spirit, and the need for the Holy Spirit um, in the Old Testament. This week, we're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit in the Gospels. Right. And we're going to talk about how the role of the Holy Spirit as it relates to salvation, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
And this is leading up to talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit, and then the mission of the Spirit. That's what we're going to, that's our overview for the next few Wednesday nights. So let's start with the Gospels this week. Let's pray. Let's ask God to anoint this study. Father, we love you. We praise your name. We give you glory and honor. We ask for the anointing of your Spirit upon this study tonight, God. Speak to our hearts, God, and show us, Lord, some things that we can learn, Lord, about your sweet spirit. In Jesus' name, we give you the praise. Amen. Amen. When we start talking about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, we as Pentecostal holiness people, and I'm talking about Church of God, Church of God of Prophecy, Church of God in Christ, Pentecostal Holiness Assembly, God, Pentecostal denominations, we usually jump right to Acts chapter 2. Right. Or we jump to 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Right. Those are our hallmark scriptures as Pentecostals. However, if we do that and neglect the Gospels, we tend to miss the true meaning of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. So tonight I want rather to begin with the baptism, the gifts, the fruit, or the outpouring, I want us to look at the Gospels tonight. There, there are three basic roles of the Holy Spirit in the Gospels. And the first one is the role in conversion or the conviction of sin. The works of the Holy Spirit are many. With relationship to our salvation is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in regeneration. We, we are drawn by the Holy Spirit to salvation. Convicted by Him, born again of the Spirit, and become a child of God. Mm -hmm. We see this in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Right. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time until his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. No one can be saved without the Holy Spirit's conviction. No one can be saved unless they're drawn by the Holy Spirit, unless they're regenerated by the Spirit of God. Without the indwelling presence of the Spirit of God. You know, I love the book of Revelation and I study that constantly and and I hear so many different views, especially from non-Pentecostals, about how the Spirit ceased. And there's even some that some non-Pentecostal views that hold the Spirit will be taken out um, at the rapture. But can I tell you, you cannot be saved unless you're drawn by the Spirit of God. You don't get saved just because someone drags you to an altar. Right. You don't get saved just because you go with a friend to the altar just to please them. You, have, you are saved when you respond to the genuine convicting power of the Spirit of God. Right. Romans 8 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. It's so that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you have not your own, for you are bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. The initial counter with the Holy Spirit occurs at Christian conversion. <coughs> Woo, getting strangled on that water. Mm. Through this encounter, individuals experience a radical inward change, which is known as being born again, spiritual rebirth, or to use the technical theological term, regeneration. The Lord promised through the prophet Ezekiel this initial saving encounter with the Spirit, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and we'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So we see 
that foreshadow in the Old Testament of the, what the Holy Spirit does when we are saved. The message of spiritual transformation is of critical importance. Today, many people want something radically new in their lives. They find life empty and meaningless and want to avoid making the same old mistakes. What they really desire is a personal experience with God, which can come only come through conversion. Mm -hmm. Conversion can be defined as a turning to God away from sin or wrongdoing and relying solely upon Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. It involves a human response to God's initiative but requires our acceptance and cooperation. The biblical words faith and repentance indicate that conversion demands on our part an authentic response of the Spirit of God. Paul taught this necessary response to receive salvation in Acts 20:21, 20, testifying both to the Jews and also the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. This can only be accomplished by the help of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the convictor of sin. Mm -hmm. How do we understand this role of the Spirit? We must first recognize the difference between a genuine conviction of the Spirit and the attack of the enemy. Mm. So the Holy Spirit gives a sense of holiness. I mean, He is the Holy Spirit. But you see, the devil, he gives a sense of worthlessness. The Holy Spirit usually gives a sense of God consciousness through the Word of God and through the power of the Spirit. The devil gives a sense of self-consciousness through feelings. If it feels good, do it. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit generally deals with one thing at a time. I remember when I first got saved, how even though I gave my heart to the Lord, started living for Him, there were some things the Holy Spirit had to convict me of in the journey. Mm -hmm. Some things that, that I had to lay aside and not do anymore, habits and things. And, and the Holy Ghost deals with one thing at a time. But you see, the enemy, he'll throw the whole book at you. Why is that? Because he's the accuser of the brethren. Right. The Holy Spirit is usually quite quiet and gentle on the heart, tugging of the heart, but the devil uses major clamoring. The Holy Spirit is specific with clarity. The devil's in general with confusion. The Holy Spirit corrects, but the enemy accuses. The Holy Spirit convicts, but the enemy condemns. The Holy Spirit deals with unconfessed sin. The enemy often throws up your past sins that have been already forgiven. And then the Holy Spirit encourages to obey God, while the enemy discourages to despair. And then gives a sense of peace with confirmation while the enemy gives pressure with a sense of frustration. The Holy Spirit leads to a life of balance pleasing to God, while the enemy leads to a life of bondage. The Holy Spirit deals with sincerity and love. The enemy deals with civility and anger. So we see those things that go on. John 16, 8 says, And when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness and of judgment. It, it, this, this word reproof means a legal term. It's a legal term to bring light to, to expose, to convict and convince. It can be properly translated in some, in, in some aspects, pronounce the verdict. The world may think that it is judging Christians, but it is the Christians who are passing judgment on the world as they witness to Jesus Christ. Believers are the witness, the Holy Spirit is the prosecuting attorney, and the unsaved are the prisoners. However, the purpose of the indictment is not to condemn, but to bring them to the point of salvation. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of, of, a, of sin, namely the sin of unbelief. 
The law of God and the conscience of man will convict the sinners of his sins specifically, but it's the work of the Spirit through the witness of believers that exposes the sin of unbelief to the lost world. After all, it is unbelief that condemns the lost sinner, according to John 3, 18 through 21, not the committing of individual sins. A person could, be, could clean up his life and quit his or her bad habits, but they could still go to hell if they're not saved. Amen. A person could be saved, could get saved, ask the Lord in their heart, but if they choose to walk away from God, then they could spend eternity away from God. You need to understand something, folks. No one can take you out of God's hand, but you can take yourself out of God's hand. Mm -hmm. The Spirit also convicts the sinner of righteousness. and Of righteousness. Whose righteousness? The righteousness of Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God. The Spirit of God reveals the Savior in the, in the Word and in this way glorifies Him. We see this in John 16, 13, and 14. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you to all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear that, he shall speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive a mind and shall show it unto you. The spirit also reveals Christ in the lives of believers. The world cannot receive or see the spirit of God, but they can see what he does is they watch the lives of the believer of God or the Christian or the child of God. Mm -hmm. The Spirit convicts the lost sinner of judgment. Do not confuse this statement with Acts 24, 25 where it talks about righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Jesus was referring to his judgment of Satan that it was that was affected by his death on the cross. John twelve thirty one says, "Now the judgment, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of the world be cast out." Satan is the prince of the world, but he is a defeated prince. Satan has already been judged, and the verdict announced. All that must take place is the executing of the sentence, which will occur when Jesus comes back to this earth. Yes. When a lost sinner is truly under conviction, he will see the folly and evil of unbelief. He will confess that he does not measure up to the righteousness of Christ and will realize that he is under condemnation because he belongs to the world and the devil. Ephesians 2, 1-3 through 3 says, and, he, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and then the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past with the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were nature the children of wrath, even as others. So you see, when we respond to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and we turn our lives over to God, we are free from sin. Mm -hmm. We are no longer sinners, but we're saints of God. Right. Now I have a problem with this saying that runs around, especially in non-Pentecostal churches, and I may get on my soapbox here for a second. I have a problem with being a sinner saved by grace. Now, if God saved me, what did He save me from right. if I'm still a sinner? Mm -hmm. I know there's a popular Southern Gospel song that sings about it. I know that there are some that say that saying all the time. But think about it for a minute. If we were saved by the grace of God, what were we saved from if we're still sinners? What did Jesus do on the cross if we were still sinners? Mm -hmm. What happened? What happens to the gospel if we're still sinners? You know, Paul said in Romans 6, 
Verses 1 and 2, shall we continue a sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God didn't save us to sin. He saved us from sin. Right. Right. From sin. Salvation is not a get out of jail free card like on Monopoly. Right. Salvation's not a Burger King Christianity where you have it your way. Right. Right. Amen. Salvation is a gift from God. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And if we're a saved people, we need to live like we're a saved people. True, true. The only person who can rescue us from sin is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There can be no conversion without conviction. And there can be no conviction apart from the Spirit of God using the Word of God and the witness of the child of God. You cannot be saved without the drawing, convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen. I don't care if mommy and daddy are the most holy people. You've got to get saved. I don't care if mom and dad, grandpa and grandma was a preacher. You can't ride their coattails to heaven. You've got to give your heart to Jesus. Right. Amen. Amen. That's the only way you can be saved is through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And that was backing me up tonight. Yes, amen. amen. So is Jenna and my wife. Amen. Amen. So we understand that. We also understand this, that He is the Comforter according yes. to the Gospels. Yes. John 14, 16 says, And I will pray the Father... He shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Mm -hmm. the, title's com the title comforter is the English translation of the Greek word parakletos or paraclete that is used in the New Testament to, de de to designate both the second and third persons of the Trinity. The word occurs five times in the New Testament, all in the writings of John, the it is found four times in the Gospel of John and one time in 1 John. We read John 14, 26 also. It says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father shall send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. We read in John 15, 26, but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I will depart, I will send them to you. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Mm -hmm. Most frequently, this word is translated comforter in the Gospel of John. In the epistle of 1 John, it is translated in 1 John 2, one advocate. The word is used as a primary title for the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The parakletos means para, which is beside or alongside. Kaleo meaning to call or one call alongside to help and give aid, it carries the idea of a close companionship or personal association. He is the comforter this evening. Yes, thank you, Lord. You know, we as Pentecostals, when we mention the Holy Spirit, we immediately think of speaking in tongues. We immediately think of the nine gifts of the Spirit. We immediately think of the fruit of the Spirit. We immediately think of prophesying. We immediately think of all these other things but we forget in the gospel of John that he is a comforter yes. the Holy Spirit first of all is an adequate comforter Jesus said in John 14 16 I will pray the father he shall give you another comforter in the English, English language there is only one word for another in the Greek, there are two, and they mean either another of the same sort or another of a different or separate sort. In this context, he's talking about a, a, a different comforter. Not, not him, but a different comforter. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit. 
The disciples here in John, in John 13 through 16 were grieving, were, were starting to grieve over the prospects of losing Jesus. He assured them that he would not leave them comfortless. He further suggested that it was even proper and speed for him to go away in order that the comforter might come. He then explained the character and quality of the Holy Spirit's ministry when he said, in effect, he will, he will be another of the same kind that I am. All that Jesus was to the disciples in the early church, the Holy Spirit would be to the church going forward in the book of Acts. He is the adequate comforter. That is why Jesus used the word altos. All that he said and more, he will be to you. John 14, 12, He that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he shall do also, and greater works than these he shall do, because I go to my Father. He knew that the disciples would need something different from, from, the, from the comforter, from the other comforters, the God the Father, God the Son of the Trinity, like Job experienced in Job 16, 2, and then like they experienced with him being there, so we see in John 14, 16, I will pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter. He will be an adequate comforter. He's also an appropriate comforter. Yes. yes. The appropriate comforter. Christ's ministry on this earth was one of solace, consolation, forgiveness, and healing, and the alleviating of guilt and grief. Likewise, the Holy Spirit has has been divinely dispatched to the aid of the believer to heal his hurts and to quiet the ag agnotism of the soul. And I want you to understand he's an appropriate comforter this evening. Yes. Because Thank you. I even went through my own life needing this comfort. Over 10 years ago, my mom went home to be with the Lord. And why I have a great church family here that I pastor. And why I have great men of God I look up to as mentors and spiritual dads in the ministry. None of them could comfort me like the Holy Spirit could during that time. Right, yes, thank you. In my grief and my fear, I sought the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And He manifested Himself to me. And assured me that he had everything in the palm of his hands. I became aware that my immediate circumstances were only temporary. That in he indeed is my comforter. We understand this. That since he's an appropriate comforter, he is an advocate. The word comforter is a translation of the word paraclete. The word advocate is the secondary translation. The Holy Spirit will minister as an advocate pleading our cause. He builds our case and serves as our representative interceding on our behalf according to Romans 8. His power and His presence encompass our total being and personality filling us with His fullness so that we are able to cope triumphantly with life and its opportunities. He's also a helper. The word paraclete means more than just a comforter. It means advocate, intercessor, teacher, guide, and helper. Some theologians avoid this discussion of the word helper because of its simplicity. Though it is particularly might detract from the high office and dignity of the third person trinity, it's refreshing to note that he is a helper. A helper is one who is called to do something. Someone who is both knowledgeable and capable. Jesus knew that the church was going to need help. He knew that each individual would be striving and that occasionally we would all need aid, that special divine assistance that only God can give. No wonder in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 when he writes to the seven churches, Jesus says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. We need the power of the Holy Spirit the comforter, the helper, to help us through our situations. He's also an abiding comforter. It says in John 4, 16, that he may abide with you forever. This means that he is a companion to us. 
The dictionary defines companion as an associate, one of one of a pair or set of like things, a person employed to hire or travel with another and act in the capacity of a friend who accompanies. John Jesus reiterates in John fourteen seventeen, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. What a relationship God has with his people. He is not a lawful and personal or elevated to the extent that he cannot abide with his people. You see, other religions, they believe their God can't be touched, that he's afar off somewhere, but our God's with us. It, Psalm 46, 1 tells us, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Right, right. Jesus was also called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so the Holy Spirit then is called the Comforter, which means He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Hallelujah. He is a present Comforter. Yes. While the Holy Spirit's ministry is very diversified, His uniqueness to the 21st century church can be described in the word presence. This is undoubtedly the difference between the true New Testament church and the religiousness group between true worshipers and those who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof, the presence of God and the awareness of the mighty witness and the baptismal inness of the Holy Spirit are hallmarks of the New Testament Pentecostal worship and living. With His abiding presence, churches grow. Without it, they die. The abiding, manifesting, demonstrating presence of the Holy Spirit in daily life makes the difference between worship marked with ritual and worship endued with power. And I submit to you this evening that in Acts 2, when the Holy Ghost was poured out, Peter said in Acts 2, In the last days, say of God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Do you realize that it started then and it continues to today? He's not saying there, oh, in the last days, God's going to send this great revival and this great, this great breakthrough thing. He's saying that the power of God is continual. Hallelujah. The same spirit that moved in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. It's moving today, hallelujah. And it all started here in the Gospel of John with this foreshadowing of what was going to happen. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Right. Hallelujah. Right. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. In Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. It appears that Peter was presiding over this particular situation. Peter asked an interesting question, Ananias, why if Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? It seems that, that a higher power was actually in charge. A higher authority had presided over the work and worship of the people. Yes, it was, yes, God worked through Peter, but it was the Holy Spirit speaking to Peter. In Acts chapter 15, in the Jerusalem Council, the Holy Spirit participated in the discussion. For when the minutes of the meeting were recorded, their common conclusion was it seemed of good to the Holy Ghost and us. The Holy Spirit is God's executive liaison sitting on, in on matters that is important to the kingdom. And I believe that's why Jesus admonished the seven churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So we see that. Thirdly, we realize that the Holy Spirit is the teacher. He is the teacher. John 14, 26. But when the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, and the Father shall send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. He teaches all things which Jesus taught. All things means all things which Jesus taught, including the presence of the Holy Spirit, who is given to help the believer through the trials of life and the indwelling presence and love of the Father and Son. However, we must understand something. The Comforter only comes from the Father through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Holy Ghost baptizer. In calling God the Father, a father-child relationship is stressed. One must become a child of God that is of the Father 
in order to be given the Father's comforter. The words in the name of Christ mean that one must approach the Father in the name of Christ. That is recognizing that Jesus alone is acceptable to God. The purpose of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life is twofold. To teach all things, both in the words and the life of Christ, both to the truth and the life, both to the word and how to live, both to the theory and the practice, both to the principles and to the conduct, both the morality and the behavior, to help remember, to remember all that has been taught in the Word of God, and to help especially in the moments of trial when truth is needed. In a moment of trial, the Holy Spirit either infuses the believer with strength to endure or flashes across the mind a way of escape. So we see that the Holy Spirit teaches us that. Another passage that discusses this is found in 1 John 2, 27, which where it talks about the Spirit's anointing teaching us all things. This is canonically linked to John 14, 1 John 2, 27. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, but you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as have taught you, you shall abide in him. Now, I want to say something tonight. I don't want it to get taken out of context. If you look at my study, there are five earned degrees after high school. An associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, a master of arts degree, a master of divinity degree, and my doctorate of ministry. I'm proud to say that I graduated from fully accredited schools and not degree mills like some graduate from today. So, some places you can just pay $50 and get a doctorate of theology <laughs> and not really pay the price. I'm thankful for all the credentials I have. I'm an ordained bishop in the Church of God. Before that, I was an ordained minister or licensed minister. Before that, I was an exhorter. I, um, I received in 2018 an Excellence in Teaching Award from the community college I teach for. I've completed a workshop on improving online teaching, which I've been doing so faithfully for the last 13 years. And I've also completed Leader Labs 1, one and I'm working on Leader Labs 2 right now, Executive Leadership Training. All that's good, and I'm grateful for that, but without the anointing of God, I'm nothing. Mm -hmm. Amen. True. I pastor a great church, a good group of people, but without the anointing of God, I'm nothing. Mm -hmm. I got voted by the ministers of the Church of God in Western North Carolina as first chair on the evangelism board. But without God's anointing, I'm nothing. Right. Do you get the picture? Right. It's not about me. It's always been about Him. Uh -huh. Amen. And we need the Spirit of God to teach us. None of us will ever graduate from what I call the University of the Holy Spirit until we get to heaven. Because He's always teaching us something new every day. I want to close tonight with John 14, 17. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither know of him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Yes. That scripture right there is a good place to end tonight so that next week we can pick up talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit moving into the gifts of the Spirit. So I'm grateful that you have joined us tonight. And I want to encourage you to, to uh, tune in Sunday morning or call in or be here in person Sunday morning. At 1040 here in the church in person, we will play Brother Paul's Sunday School video. And then at 11 a.m. we'll begin with service. The Lord has gave me a word for Sunday morning. And I want to encourage you to be here for that. Then Sunday evening we'll be back online only at 5 p.m. with the Sunday evening message. Lord willing, I'm going to preach a message entitled, There's Death in the Pot. And so we want you to tune in for that. 
Don't forget these announcements. I pray God's blessings on you. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we glorify your name. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we have to be in your house tonight. Lord, I pray, God, that, Lord, you would just be that comfort to us through your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would convict us of any sin and that, God, you would just, Lord, teach us and lead us and guide us. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you this evening. May he keep you in his hand. And we will see you on Sunday. God bless you. Bye-bye.